Here we go. Once again, the sun's out. It's the end of the year, so uh, coming upon us. And what people usually do at this time of the uh, year is they uh, reflect, reflect on what's happened in the last uh, um, 12 months. Well, we've got a lot to reflect on in Australia. Maybe not the type of thing that uh, you'd, think, you'd think about. I mean, we've had a federal election, we've had a Victorian state election, we've had floods, no, cycl no cyclones to date. We've had the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we've had the United States uh, ratcheting up the tension with China over Taiwan. So what does it all mean for us? Well, there's a few important things that have happened which most people are really not discussing or talking about. Now, obviously, if you're going to ratchet tension with China, there is a price to pay. Whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not, China is a superpower and so is the United States. They're a superpower because they're nuclear armed and they've got tons of armament and tons of people they're quite happy to sacrifice to uh, suit their agenda. And that's the beauty of a state, whether it's democratic or autocratic. The fact is, its armed forces are there not just to protect people from external invasion, but to increase its sphere of influence. So what has it been for Australia? Now we've pinned our coattails to the United States coattails without thinking we have thrown all our eggs in the one basket while our neighbours like Indonesia and Malaysia and Thailand, Cambodia have a different attitude to China's ascendancy we've decided that as a nation we're going to fight and what does that mean? That means the extension of the United States uh, bases in Australia, including Pine Gap. It means the deployment of increasing number of US troops in Northern Australia. It means more defence contracts with the US military industrial complex, as we see with the nuclear submarines. And it means turning this area, which is a nuclear three zone, into a nuclear zone. That's what having nuclear powered submarines is all about. At the same time, while the US is involved in this brinkmanship with China over Taiwan, we find ourselves, the Ukrainians find themselves in the position that we could find ourselves in the, in the same position in five years time. What the Ukrainians have found is they've now they become proxies in a war between the US, you know, between Soviet, between Russia and the US. They're the meat in the middle. Now this particular conflict, I know it's easy for me to say, could have been avoided. But because the US and Russia wanted to flex their muscles, this invasion occurred and this invasion is costing the lives of thousands if not tens of thousands of people ultimately for what? So that's something we've got we need to look forward to in the next two to three to five years is our involvement in the US we will become a proxy war over Taiwan because the thing about modern warfare it's rapid it's conducted from tens of thousands of miles away. It's highly destructive. And as we've seen in the Ukraine, civilian casualties are enormous. In modern warfare, 90% of casualties are civilians and 10% are military. In the good old days, in inverted commas, where people slaughtered each other for the glory of God, king and country, we had millions of people millions of people dying but most of them were military personnel not civilians so let's move on what's the next thing to look forward to 
Now it's extraordinary, you know, if the Christmas and end of, end of year celebrations. It's extraordinary the amount of newspaper, television, social media commentary there is about the poor, the dispossessed, the exploited and how we need to collect food, distribute food, how people at Christmas find themselves in this particular situation, how there's always this issue of homelessness and an increasing levels of homelessness in our community. Now if we turned the camera back 60 years, they'd have the same debate. Food security, energy security, housing security, the same debate over and over and over again. So why do things never change? Why do thing, things don't change? And more importantly, why is this the first generation since Federation whose living standards and lifestyle will go backwards? And to a significant degree, we have been responsible for the slide backwards. Because we accepted the neoliberal agenda of privatisation, deregulation, corporatisation and globalisation. And although a small section of the population have become very rich, extremely rich, most of the population, about 80 to 85 percent, now find themselves in a debt circle. They need to work to pay their debts, interest rates go up, they need to continue to work to pay their debts, and their debts are not for extraordinary, useless things, but things like housing. Anywhere between 30 to 60 percent of people's income and I'm including people on social security benefits, goes towards paying rent or servicing a mortgage. That's an extraordinary amount. And what we've seen over the last 20 years, 30 years, is the privatisation of the public housing sector. And those states which have continued to have public housing, under-resourced public housing sector. The whole purpose of public housing was to provide people permanent, stable, accommodation who are actually not able to buy in the private marketplace. With the privatisation of public housing and the under-resourcing of public housing, we've seen the private marketplace take off. I'll give you an example. A house, say in a cent in a inner city suburb, which you bought 40, 40 years ago, would be worth 35 to 40 times the level. That's not because wages have increased. That's because we've privatised housing. We've removed the public sector from housing. When you privatise an essential service, whether it's housing or finances, financial services through the banking sector, you will find that competition dramatically decreases and prices and fees and charges increase exponentially. And when the Australian residential market was opened up to private investors from overseas, we saw a rush of private investment to the residential market. And this rush of investment basically caused an exponential rise in housing prices. Now it's very fashionable today in Australia in 2022 and I'm just amazed by the number of times I hear this from people who are theoretically have some type of political understanding is that it's all the Chinese fault. It's the Chinese investors fault. Well the fact is it's very simple. If you live in Thailand and you're a foreigner you cannot invest in the residential market. You can invest in the business market, the office market, but not the residential market because they understood what private investors would do to a residential market. In Australia, it was the other way around. We opened up the residential market. Obviously, many Chinese investors came into this country and bought residential property because it was a good investment not only in terms of being an investment, in terms of making money, but investment in terms of, 
obtaining citizenship at a later date. So there's no point blaming the Chinese for the increasing in housing price and the fact that you can't rent at a reasonable rent or you can't buy at a reasonable price. The fact is Chinese investors as well as other investors from around the world took advantage of the change in legislation. So to a significant degree the current housing crisis is a crisis which was engineered by legislation which was passed through the Australian Parliament. And to re re resolve that crisis, again, legislation needs to be passed in the Australian Parliament. But because the 1% that own the means of production, distribution, exchange, communication has such an extraordinary power as far as parliamentary elections are concerned at the state and federal level, we'll find that most governments will not be willing to do anything about it. So let's be realistic. It's about legislation. Legislation which is based on policies, which are based on ideology, not the satisfaction of real human needs. So if we've got a housing crisis, again it's our problem because we allowed the privatisation corporatisation, globalisation and deregulation mantra to dominate every aspect of our lives. Then we've got the increasing CO2 emissions in the climate emergency. Now anybody who's lived in this country for a few decades will know that things have changed. Climate has changed. And the first people who will tell you that are fruit and vegetable growers as well as wheat growers because changing because changing climate has a direct impact on growers it may not have a direct impact on the urban population but it has, has a direct impact on people involved in agricultural pursuits and as we see people who have built their homes or have been allowed to build homes on floodplains and the list goes on and on. So the climate emergency is real and, and it's quite extraordinary that in 2022 we continue to, many people continue to deny that it's a, a real issue. I mean ultimately we are flesh and blood, we're not, nothing more than a bag of salty water and as temperatures increase it has an impact on us. Pandemics. The COVID-19 pandemic is not over. It's mutating. It's changing. We're developing slowly herd immunity. But it's still having a tremendous impact on the population. And the tragedy is that the people who bore the brunt of the pandemic economically were small business who continue to support neoliberal policies. The fact is that what we've seen is a transformation of the Australian economy from an economy which is based on agriculture and small business to an economy which is based on the domination of specific fields of human endeavour by large corporations which are too big to fail. We saw this in the banking sector when the Royal Commission pointed out how troublesome and difficult ba the banking sector was in terms of the harm it caused to the population. But people say, well Joe, we now have a Labor Party in power. Well unfortunately in a representative democracy, and we don't, we don't live in a direct democracy, but in a representative democracy, we don't live in a society where the will of the people uh, is expressed in legislation. We live in a society where the will of the dominant class, the 1% that own the means of production, distribution, exchange and communication, the 8% of Australians of disposable income to be invest in tax friendly uh, investment schemes, whether it's residential property, whether it's uh, buying and selling of shares, 
the fact is that one of the few countries, if not the only country in the world, that actually pays people for buying shares and actually pays people for having more than one home. So I can stand here and talk about the negatives. What are the positives? What should we aim for in 2023? One is a rational analysis of the US-Australian alliance. The current alliance is bad for Australia and bad for Australians. Secondly, as far as housing is concerned, we need to develop movements to promote public housing and stop the wholesale privatisation of the housing sector in this country. We need to stop foreign investors being able to buy and sell residential property. We need to close that loophole. As far as investments are concerned, we need to understand that we don't need private investors to actually bankroll the creation and the maintenance of essential services. If we want food security, energy security, housing security and action against climate change, it's not about the green dollar, it's about legislation which promotes those concepts that decrease CO2 emissions. And lastly but not leastly, I think the most important topic or the most important campaign we can be involved in in 2023 is a universal basic income. We have the resources, especially mining resources, which we've given away to the private sector for a peppercorn rent and minimal taxation revenue. We have given it away. It's time that we put the nationalisation without compensation of our mineral resources on the public agenda. Not pussyfoot around, but actually talk about forced nationalisation without compensation. And for any new mineral or resource project, that it be publicly funded, not privately funded. Because could you imagine the amount of income this country would have if this, these mining resources were private, were publicly funded, not privately funded? And we see the, see the creation of billionaires in this country because of their monopoly on the development and extraction of natural resources. We've seen corporations rake in billions of dollars every year. If that money went into the Treasury because the exploitation of our mineral resources was a public exploitation, we would have more than enough finances to fund a universal basic income, to fund public housing, to ensure we don't need charities to send Australian children to public schools to ensure that every person living in this country has access to the right amount of food and has a roof over their heads. A universal basic income breaks the wage slave debt nexus because it allows individuals to take time off from wage slavery and actually develop themselves become involved in community campaigns and national campaigns to improve the lives of everybody, not just the lives of a minuscule minority which continues to manipulate the parliamentary system, which continues to make Australia an economic basket case. Yes, an economic basket case. When you think the type of world we could have in this country the type of society we could, we could create if we controlled our own resources and the impact we could have on decreasing CO2 emissions. You can understand that change is needed. So if you're interested in these concepts, especially universal basic income, I encourage you to join public interest before corporate interest. Yes, we are still alive, barely, on life support, but we are still alive. So you can join simply by going to pibci.net. You can join online. 
If you don't want to join online, you want a paper form, give us a ring 0439 395 489. And ultimately, our last message for 2022. Remember, we are the people we've been waiting for. It's not our political representatives. It's not our financial masters. It's not the one percent that's. It's not the one percent that only means the production, distribution, exchange, communication. It's not the eight percent that are part of the investment class. We are the people we've been waiting for, and we, if we don't grab our opportunities as they arise in 2023, at the end of 2023, if I'm still here, I will be giving you exactly the same spiel. Join public interest before corporate interest today. Do yourself a favour. Join now.